Hello, and welcome to Palisade Corporation's webcast, Life Cycle Cost Analysis Using At Risk, presented by Anthony Scalafani. My name is Jameson Romeo Hall, and I will be your host today. I'll be available to help answer technical questions by chat. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. The attendee list is suppressed to maintain attendee privacy. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by clicking on the Q&A panel. I would also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for a free trial download of our software, including our lead products at risk and the Decision Tool Suite. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. Tony, you have the webcast. Great. Thank you, Jameson, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Jameson said, my name is Anthony Scalafani, and the title of this presentation is Life Cycle Cost Analysis Using At Risk. The agenda for this morning uh, will be to go through about five topics here, and we imagine that there's going to be uh, a range of levels of expertise of, of participants today. So first we'll talk about an introduction to life cycle cost analysis and then we'll use uh, or go through an example of using point estimates to do a traditional life cycle cost uh, analysis. And once we have that somewhat understood, I will talk a little bit about Monte Carlo simulation for people that are maybe less familiar and then really get into uh, the point of this webinar, which is using at risk to embed or to use Monte Carlo simulation to do a life cycle cost analysis. And once we have the, the point estimate analysis and the Monte Carlo analysis, we'll be able to compare them and draw some conclusions. Uh, and once those are established, we will take uh, questions and hopefully give you some answers. So a little bit about my background. Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering. I'm a certified energy manager and I do or I work on the development and the, the construction of projects that conserve energy, water, greenhouse gases. And the reason that I say that is because that's going to be the slant on the life cycle cost analysis today. It'll be focused um, somewhat on, on these type of projects which are maybe a little a little different or specific than uh, other things people are using life cycle cost analysis for. And my, my background in those type of projects is uh, mostly on the savings analysis and, and financial modeling, the math side of it, rather than the actual construction. With that said, uh, this would be a little bit of an introduction to life cycle cost analysis, which is an analytical method for the comparison of project alternatives. So. What does that mean? Uh, an owner of a facility or, or an agency may be deciding how to spend their money between uh, two or more alternatives. And normally one of those alternatives, at least in an existing building or an existing facility, would be to maintain uh, the facility as is. So sort of the base case is the first alternative and then some upgrade or some investment would be the second alternative. And, and using life cycle cost analysis, we can compare many alternatives that have different useful lifetimes, uh, all on the same equivalent basis, which is really the, the power of the method. Life cycle cost analysis compares the alternatives uh, on a financial basis, on the basis of dollars, rather than comparing uh, how much greenhouse gases different alternatives would save or uh, some more qualitative metrics like improving, um, let's say, patient uh, favorability of a hospital or something like that, uh, the, the actual environment. So it's a, it's, a, it's a method of comparing alternatives based on dollars over the lifetime of equipment. So for a hospital, they may be comparing uh, an investment into the infrastructure versus the installation of a new MRI machine or something like that where they're, they're totally different alternatives um, not related to each other at all but they're both an investment of dollars that, that bring some return over time. 
And another, another powerful part of life cycle cost analysis is that it's a way to compare the alternatives either in, in nominal dollars or in real dollars, meaning we can look at the uh, expected actual cash outlay nominal dollars including inflation over the life cycle of an alternative, or we can use net present value methods or present value to look at uh, real dollars in terms of, uh, let's say, 2014 dollars out into the future. So with that said about life cycle cost analysis, we will get into an example using traditional point estimates. And this is the way <clears throat> it seems most life cycle cost analysis is performed, either with uh, custom user created spreadsheets, spreadsheets that are made available by certain state agencies, or with uh, purpose-built software, uh, Java-based software, uh, published by the, the U.S. federal government. And these all use point estimates for, for future values. So for the uh, example of, of doing a point estimate life cycle cost analysis today, I'm going to be talking about a, a facility owner who may be considering a lighting retrofit in a commercial building, taking down all of the old uh, linear fluorescent light fixtures, the long four foot maybe tube lights, and replacing them with brand new LED fixtures, which are sort of the state of the art. And we'll assume the building's about 50,000 square feet in size. And the reason they would do this would be to reduce their energy costs and comply with certain building codes and, and so on. And maybe an owner wants to know by going to an, an LED alternative, am I really going to save money and, and how much and is it a good decision to invest the capital to do this kind of work? So to run through this type of an example, what I have done is created a spreadsheet in Excel. Like I said, uh, there are uh, certain sort of custom spreadsheets of, of which this would be one. There are some that are provided by, by state agencies or, or organizations to use as a template and CAN software. And so for the purpose of using at risk and using Monte Carlo simulation, um, this needs to be a custom Excel spreadsheet, of course. And so I will move over to Excel and walk through um, exactly what's going on in case it's not very clear from the PowerPoint here. So what we have going on in this lifecycle cost analysis spreadsheet is we have a region with all of the inputs that go into the analysis. We have one life cycle cost analysis of what I'm calling the status quo, the pre-retrofit scenario. This would be the building as it exists today with linear fluorescent lights. And then we have another analysis done uh, in the, the post-retrofit scenario with, we could say, LED lights. And uh, the way this is set up here is that in this particular scenario, we are fortunate because LED lights have a published uh, rated useful life, and it usually ends up somewhere around 20 years. So what we want to know is if I spend money today to buy these LED lights, how does that um, look over 20 years? And then similarly, we will compare uh, the base case of just maintaining the existing lights for the same time period. Now that's not necessarily a, a requirement. Like I had said before, one of the strengths of using life cycle cost analysis is that we could compare different types of projects with different useful lives. And by uh, looking at the um, life cycle cost on a present value basis, we can bring uh, the total costs of ownership into 2014 dollars and make an apples to apples comparison. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm showing both of these as uh, 20 year projects here. And so what, what we have going on in the base case, we, we're looking at 20 years, as I had said, and uh, we'll say year zero is today, and this is somewhat convenient because we're almost at the end of 2014, and so we can say that year one begins on January 1st of 2015. And so today, 
uh, maybe between now and the end of the year, the owner is not going to spend any money uh, on maintaining their lighting system. But next year and in subsequent years, they'll spend some dollar amount maintaining their lights, changing, uh, changing out burnt out lamps or, or lenses or different things. They'll, they'll need to do some maintenance. And then every year there's some energy cost associated with running the lighting system. Uh, in this particular case, um, utility incentives are another component. As we try in life cycle cost analysis to capture um, all of the costs and all of the benefits associated with a system, what we want to do is, is sort of identify where those are all coming from. So in this scenario, I have a column for utility incentives. Uh, which is money paid by a utility to encourage people to use more efficient technology. If you are going to use uh, life cycle cost analysis to compare different types of projects, uh, other than energy related projects, you might not have this column. You might only have um, energy costs and, and maintenance costs, something like that. And those values that, that we've identified uh, in each year sum to what I'm calling the net cost and this would be in nominal dollars. So as uh, energy prices go up over time, the cost of operating goes up, and, and so does maintenance, and so does the net cost accordingly. But as I had mentioned, one of the strengths of life cycle cost analysis is that we can look at these in terms of present value and bring these dollars back to today using uh, some discount rate that, that we may select for our analysis and that, that would be required by some of the, the CAM software. And we end up at some present value. So over 20 years, it's uh, around $400,000 to own the existing system. And in the post-retrofit scenario, the math looks a little bit different here because we have a um, installation cost of the new LED lights that uh, would occur now. So we assume that uh, we, we simplify this a little bit and we say construction may happen very quickly between now and the end of the year and billing and, and everything will, will happen by then so that this is a cost incurred between today and the end of the year. And once the new lights are installed, the utility pays some incentives back to us and we end up with a, a large net cost of construction, which makes sense. And another way that, that this alternative uh, varies from the base case is that we assume uh, with much longer lamp lives, the LED lighting does not require any maintenance, which is a big assumption, uh, for the first 10 years. And then we assume that after that, the maintenance might be the same as a fluorescent lighting system. We're also going to take uh, some credit for a lower energy usage uh, of the more efficient lights. And so these costs are all a little bit different than what you would see in the base case. And we've talked about utility incentives. So we arrive then at the, the net cost for the alternative. And we calculate the present value of these. And we end up with a present value over the life of the equipment of about $373,000. And what's really useful or where you end up going with this is looking at the difference <clears throat> between the present value of both of these alternatives, which is what I'm calling the NPV delta here. And this is a type of a cash flow analysis. And at the, at the uh, end of the 20 years, we see that the LED alternative has a positive NPV of around $62,000. And so what, is, what does this mean? This would typically be the stopping point of a life cycle cost analysis that uses point estimates. Someone would say, okay, I've plugged in all of the values and, and made reasonable assumptions, and they tell the owner of the facility, uh, you have a positive NPV to the tune of $62,000, so you should go ahead and, and implement this. But the owner is, is probably very smart and knows that there are a lot of assumptions that, that go into the analysis up in these inputs here. And so this is really where um, the power of at-risk and Monte Carlo simulation reveals itself 
to help the owner make better decisions. And so um, at, at this point, I will flip back to the PowerPoint and we'll talk through how we would go about um, using Monte Carlo simulation to improve this analysis and how that can help the owner here. And one thing I would point out, uh, as I had said uh, before, we'll, we'll come back to this, um, the base case linear fluorescent uh, life cycle cost is about $436,000 and the LEDs was $373,000 with a net NPV of, of $62,000. And we'll use this later in the Monte Carlo simulation um, to help us understand what, what we will determine is how much should we believe this number that's been presented to us as the owner. Uh, and so as you have probably gathered from the uh, Palisade website, there's many different ways to describe Monte Carlo simulation. Um, I've broken it down in the process into about four bullet points here. <clears throat> in, in the first step, of what we need to do is we need to look at our model so we could go back to the Excel file here and we need to think about all of our inputs that have some uncertainty. What, what are the things that, that can change or that we, are, we, we know that we're making guesses about? And what we can do with at risk is we can replace these static values, these point estimates, these simple guesses that we've made with a range of, of possible options by using probability distributions. So we use the distribution to describe the universe of, of possible outcomes for all of the variables, which sounds very um, maybe overwhelming, but it's, it's actually fairly simple when we take it piece by piece. And once we've specified uh, all of the probability distributions in an existing model, then we run a simulation. And the way the simulation is run, um, a, a static value is, is randomly selected from each input distribution. So we have a distribution that uh, can lead to many results, and one of those results is selected at random and is plugged into the calculations. And uh, the results of the calculation is stored in memory and then the computer performs that same random selection, calculation, storage of results, uh, maybe thousands of times. And once the simulation is complete, that's when we will review and interpret the results, compare them to the point estimate example, and see how that changes our uh, understanding of the life cycle cost or, or the decision making process here. And so, what we'll do is we'll go back to the model. I've, I've made a different worksheet for the sake of illustrating uh, how we will use at risk here. And as I had just said, uh, the first step will be to identify inputs that have some uncertainty. And so fortunately now in at risk, uh, the software will highlight for us the variables that, that we are saying have some uncertainty. And at this point I will move over to the model and we'll, we'll talk through some of those. And so uh, I will maybe go through each, each input here. So the first one uh, that is not highlighted in yellow, which means we, we don't think there's any uncertainty, is the area of the building, the square footage. That's something that we can maybe measure in an existing building, and we don't expect the building will spontaneously change its shape. And so there's certainty there, and, and that one won't vary. Um, the operating hours for the existing lighting system, however, uh, is, is highly variable. Uh, we may have some people in their offices who turn on the lights and they go home in the afternoon and they never shut off their lights and, and maybe a, a janitor has to turn off the lights at night or something. So they have very long operating hours. And even if you're not um, familiar with energy savings and, and so on, you, you're still probably aware that if you leave the lights on longer, uh, it uses more energy and costs more money. Whereas uh, the person uh, in the office next door uh, may spend all day working without their lights on because they have many windows and, and so on. So different occupants in different spaces uh, and, and maybe at different times of the year will have different operating hours for their lights. 
maybe some traveling salesperson um, will end up uh, in, in this time of the year, in the holidays, around the new year, spend a lot of time in the office, so seasonally the lights may be on more, and at, at other times of the year when the salesperson is out meeting customers, they're not in the office and the lights are off. So there can be quite a bit of variability here. Um, as we try to calculate the, the energy cost associated with the different systems, the rate, um, the dollars per unit of energy that is paid, uh, can be uh, highly variable as well. Not necessarily highly variable, but, but somewhat variable. For example, some commercial buildings pay a certain rate for the first block of energy that they use, and for the second block they pay a much different rate. And so if a building is on the cusp or on the threshold between those two blocks, when we make a, a projection in this life cycle cost analysis, we may not know which block they will fall into ultimately. And so what, what will be the real cost of energy? We don't, we don't know. Similarly, the incentive rate, the amount of money that is uh, paid back by the utility to encourage us to do this project may be variable. It may depend on measurements that they take. It may depend on the amount of funding that they have available, which may uh, decrease as other projects are, are executed. And another uh, uncertain variable is the future uh, escalation in energy prices. As we've seen recently with the change in the price of oil, which, which doesn't always directly correlate with a change in electricity prices, um, we see that, that energy prices are, can be volatile at times. Uh, many times in these type of calculations, analysts will assume that uh, electricity prices will escalate at, at 3 to 5 percent, and that will be a static value year after year or, or so on, and rarely do they consider a deflation in, in prices, and so this is another area of uncertainty. Similarly, the cost of maintenance will change over time. This is arguably related more to general inflation in the economy. The uh, discount rate or the borrowing cost, if this was a, a building, say, owned by a state agency and that they were going to uh, use municipal funding, uh, borrowed money to pay for the retrofit, the, uh, the borrowing cost may not be locked in or, or known at the time that the analysis is performed. So it's not until they agree to do the project and go out to borrow that they, they know really what their rate is. Um, similarly, the dollar spent on maintenance every year uh, will, will be variable. It's probably impossible to predict in advance how many lights will, will burn out and require maintenance in a given year. Um, also, the power consumption used by the existing fixtures and the proposed fixtures is somewhat variable. Um, each, each fixture itself probably uses some slightly different amount of power when it's when it's energized out at some decimal place uh, from every other fixture. And so uh, if we were to normalize the, the total lighting energy per square foot of building space, that number is going to be variable. It's not necessarily a simple a simple calculation. So okay, we've we've talked about some inputs that have some uncertainty here, depending on where this project is at. Uh, for example, the cost of the retrofit itself, I'm saying, has no uncertainty, and uh, that, that's something that, that changes as the project develops. At first, uh, there is some uncertainty in the cost, but once uh, contractors are brought out and, and quotes are obtained, we may know the budget, and that's, that may be a final price. And so at some point, we can say, okay, we have certainty in that number. We don't need to um, model it in at risk. Okay, so here are uh, the eight or, or nine or so variables with uncertainty. How do we model these things and, and what are some of the distributions that uh, have been chosen and why? So if we were to go to the lighting operating hours, 
uh, we would be able to see that I have already put in a, a distribution here. And in this particular case, uh, I've chosen to use a PERT distribution where um, the, I think the distinguishing factors in um, the PERT distribution are that there is a minimum value and a maximum value. And this is really important in, in this type of a variable because we know the lights at, at a minimum can be on zero hours per year. There are no negative values for lighting run hours. So we need to be able to establish a lower limit. And we know that the most they, that the lights could be on for would be for every hour of the year. And uh, that is uh, between eight and, and 9,000 hours per year. So we need to be able to establish a, a limit there as well. And then we may know a, a most likely value which is related to how many hours is this commercial building open per day, how many days per year, etc. And so that's normally the number that would be used in the energy calculation without consideration of, of variability. And so in this case, I've picked some limits for the sake of discussion, and we will talk later about how we might be able to make uh, better estimates of that, of that distribution. The distribution for electricity cost would be handled a little bit differently. Um, I had said that maybe there are two blocks of energy with two different prices. So unlike the PERT distribution, which is continuous, we can choose any value from within that uh, shape, if you will. Um, with the electricity cost, there are only two options. This is a discrete distribution, and so we could say the two options are in the first block of energy, you pay $0.08 cents per unit. And in the second block of energy, you pay $0.10 cents per unit. In, in no situation is there an option to pay $0.09 cents or $0.11 cents or, or something else. There's only two options. And this is uh, public information that, that someone could go get for a specific building. And we need some way of, of determining the likelihood of landing in either of these rate blocks. And so I've, uh, for the sake of discussion, assumed there's about a 25% chance that in a given month or, or year, um, the building will end up in this rate block, uh, and 75% chance that they will end up in, in this rate block and pay 10 cents per unit. Um, as far as the utility incentive rate, I'm using a different distribution here. This would be a uniform distribution. And uh, we have basically some, some values. Maybe I know these values. Um, but the, the point of this is more to say that uh, maybe we know nothing about the likelihood of getting a certain payout from the utility. We may only know it's between some minimum value and some maximum value. We don't know if anything is more likely than than anything else, and so we model it with a, a uniform distribution here. Um, for the power uh, density of the lighting, the uh, power required by a, a fixture or for all of the fixtures, I've again used a PERT distribution because it will have a lower and an upper limit. The power usage cannot be negative and it cannot be infinite, and so we need to establish some boundaries here and the most likely value. Uh, normally at this stage, if, if I was to just pick distributions, I may also consider a triangle distribution, which gives a bit more weight out in the tails of the distribution. Um, but for the sake of uh, discussion, I've just left it as, as PERT because we don't know any measured information one way or another. Uh, as far as the energy price escalation, here uh, I do have a triangle distribution, again, mostly for the sake of discussion. And uh, what we have here is uh, a lower limit of minus 1%. So I'm assuming that uh, somewhat arbitrarily that uh, electricity prices could perhaps go down by 1% in a year and they could increase by up to 5% per year, 
and I'm saying the most likely value is about a 3% increase per year. And I've been asked before, <clears throat> is there any way to make a, a more informed guess about this? And, and I would say slightly, we can rely on the guesses of others, but um, forecasting future energy prices is um, probably outside the scope of, of work of, of someone who would be doing a life cycle cost analysis such as this. Uh, similar to uh, energy price escalation, we can use a distribution for O&M cost escalation that looks, it looks similar. You might model this one a little bit differently based on uh, your, your projection of overall inflation in an economy, whereas the energy price escalation has an inflation component and then a supply and demand component. So the two, although they're modeled the same, roughly here, uh, you may choose to model them a little differently in, in reality. The borrowing cost, uh, we know, uh, is, is uncertain until uh, the borrowing, uh, until the rate is locked in. But we may be able to make some educated guess if we know that the money will be borrowed in the next 30 days or, or 60 days or something like that and we have an idea of where rates have been on uh, issuance of a similar term, we may be able to bracket a, a low end and a, a high end on borrowing cost. And we may not think that any particular number is more likely than any other. So I've used a, a uniform distribution here. Uh, similarly, on the maintenance cost, um, we may pick some, some numbers that we think are reasonable guesses and assume that the, the number of lights that, that burn out is um, somewhat totally unknown between those two values. We have an idea of a lower and upper limit, but we don't know uh, that any number of, of light burnouts or light maintenance is more likely than, than any other. And we, we may use the same uh, distribution on the LED lighting power density as on um, uh, the existing power density in terms of how much variability is there in energy usage between fixtures. Maybe it's, maybe it's the same, maybe it's different, but it's, it's still somewhat uncertain. So, okay, so we've uh, talked about which inputs have uncertainty and we've shown that using at risk we can define distributions and insert some values some distributions in place of point values. And so once these are all uh, set up here, you may want to mark a few outputs using at risk for the things that you are really interested in finding. And I will um, run this particular simulation. I've got it set up to run 10,000 iterations. On a simple model like this, uh, this will go fairly quickly. And so we see this is taking about 10 seconds to do the uh, 10,000 iterations here. And since I had the cursor on one of my input distributions, I get this window that where the, the red bars are um, the frequency of the results. And I see that this matches the blue line, which was our input distribution. So that's, that's what we expect, is that over, over many iterations, in a simulation, the randomly selected values occur uh, with a frequency that, that matches the, the likelihood we expect from the probability distribution. So we expected very few values over here, and, and that's what we got. So the software works. Okay. So the next step, now that we have results, is we will review what, what they look like and compare them to what we had calculated in the original point estimate example. So to review the results, um, I'm most interested in what I had called the NPV delta, the difference in the present value between the uh, base case and the LED retrofit. So this, this number down here is uh, the median, which matches the calculations we did in the point estimate scenario, so 62,475, 
1062.2475, which is basically a setting in at risk to show that value. And we can interpret that as, as savings. So we are spending money every year in, in both scenarios. Neither scenario is, is free money, but we see that the LED scenario will um, produce net savings. But if we want to look at the results in terms of um, at risk in the actual Monte Carlo simulation, this, this is what we get. So instead of a static value of 62,475, which is just represented by this line here, we get the distribution of possible results, the entire universe of outcomes, along with the likelihood that different outcomes will occur. And as we move the slider, the uh, percentage of, of results that fall below or above the lines change, and that makes it really easy for us to find values that we're interested in and, and make decisions and so on. So, okay, we've, we've done the math, we've done point estimates, we've done Monte Carlo simulation. What is the punchline if we go to compare the results? So I would come here uh, back to the PowerPoint, and this is the way I would present the results. I've sort of struck out the results from the point estimate case, where we were thinking in terms of single numbers. Now that we're using Monte Carlo simulation, we don't think about single numbers in, in isolation. We think about the range of life cycle costs for the linear fluorescence, the range of possible life cycle costs for the LEDs, and the range of uh, net cost or savings between the two alternatives here. So we have to sort of think about these and use the sliders and, and come to some understanding. What we end up seeing is that there is an 85% probability that the net present value of the savings is greater than zero. Okay, what does that mean? If we compare those two alternatives on a net present value basis, there's an 85% chance, roughly 60 plus 25, 85% chance I have positive savings, that, that money came back to the owner's bank account. So the owner can have 85% certainty that this is a good idea, you could say. Maybe the owner is, is able to establish some threshold. They want 80% certainty. And if they have 80% certainty that NPV is positive, they will buy a project rather than just knowing uh, somebody who did some math says the savings will be $62,000 and you will believe that and, and in 20 years you will expect to see $62,475 uh, come back to the bank account somewhere. Uh, the owner knows that that's not going to happen. So the owner probably will feel better understanding the likelihood that, that results are positive rather than um, becoming s stuck focused on, on a particular number. Okay. We also see that there is a 75% probability that the savings will be less than the point estimate value. Let's look at that. Well, what, what does that mean? So we have 60%. Here, here's the point estimate value. And we have 60% of the results fall to the left plus 15. That's about 75%. So somebody told the owner that they will uh, end up saving between the two alternatives, $62,000. But once the owner is able to see a, a Monte Carlo simulation of the possible results, the owner learns that there's actually a 75% chance that it's going to be somewhat less, that, they're, that, that that is too much of an optimistic forecast for them, and that's not really uh, the, the level of, of investment that's of return that they will achieve on their investment. And the owner may have some threshold in, in that regard as well. We said that a construction project will cost somewhere around $100,000 maybe plus minus. <clears throat> and so if this value were, were much lower or if the median were much lower, if, if it was just likely that, that the return was going to be positive by $1 over 20 years, the owner may say, well, I'm investing 
$100,000 today to get up to $1 over 20 years is, is not worth my time, even though the NPV is still positive. So this is another reason um, that the owner may want to use a, a simulation using Monte Carlo uh, to, to look at the range, the spread of possible results here. And another, another strength of using at risk to do this type of analysis is that there's a built-in sensitivity analysis component to it. So we can go back to the model and instead of looking at the distribution of results, we can go look at the tornado graph and see which of our inputs have the biggest impact on the results. So these are the inputs where we had put in some probability distributions, then we can see which ones uh, shift our results towards uh, being more negative versus more positive. And I will come back to this in a minute to talk about how we might make some decisions based on this, but the, the point is um, sometimes uh, people who do life cycle cost analyses using the, the CAN software or the uh, pre created spreadsheets may want to do some sensitivity analysis, but there's some limit on um, how many different variables and boundaries can they test simultaneously. Normally it's going to be three, five, ten um, different versions of the spreadsheet and some decisions are made on that. Whereas the, the strength of using something like at risk is that we can test uh, thousands and thousands of variations on all of the inputs simultaneously and in the background uh, it will create some type of a plot like this where we can get the information we need without having to go create 10 or a thousand spreadsheets ourselves. So that's very nice. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll come back to the sensitivity analysis, but is, is the conclusion of the comparison of these two analysis methods, um, we can we can use Monte Carlo simulation incorporated into life cycle cost analysis. And number one, we can use that to make more informed buying decisions. The owner can look at the distribution of outputs and decide if there's an appropriate uh, amount of risk that the benefits will fall short or um, understand what is the, the likelihood uh, of a particular value occurring and, and so on. So it increases uh, the richness of the information that an owner can use to make decisions. Second, the, the model and the sensitivity analysis can be used to target where money may be spent to remove uncertainty. So in our example, we had talked about a project that may cost $100,000. Well, let's say that this was a major nationwide program that the uh, federal government was going to do in, in federal buildings. They were going to change all of the lighting in all of the buildings. That could be a, a $100 million or, or much more um, project, a project of value of, of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so <clears throat> that would be uh, obviously a lot of money and they could look at the sensitivity analysis and say, okay, what are, what are the things that are driving the uncertainty here? Well, one of them is, is the operating hours of the lights, and there's some assumptions behind that, that distribution. If I made bad assumptions when I set up that distribution, I have bad results. And so in a $100 million project, um, there may be a decision made to spend some, some thousands of dollars um, taking some measurements. There's different ways to measure operating hours going out into buildings, taking physical measurements, sampling data to uh, come up with a way to more accurately model that distribution and reduce the uncertainty here. Similarly, in the existing and proposed light and power densities, those are things that can be measured. Light bulbs can be, fixtures can be, uh, call it plugged in or powered up, and measurements can be taken, and much more certainty can be achieved and the spread of these distributions would narrow and so on to help make a more informed $100 million decision. Um, also we see on, on, on the flip side of that 
is there are places where maybe it, it doesn't make sense to spend the money uh, to try to achieve more certainty. And, and for those things, we would look towards the bottom of the uh, tornado graph here. So specifically, the, the lowest impact item is the utility incentives in, in this scenario. So in other analyses, that may be a more important thing. But here we see that it has very little impact compared to things that are easily measured. So we may not choose to spend a lot of money uh, discussing or negotiating with the utility how the, the uh, incentives would be paid out. Um, as I had alluded to when I mentioned taking measurements, um, something we can do instead of speculating on the way distributions should be modeled or um, using expert opinion, if you will, on how they should be modeled. We can use historical data and use at risk to fit distributions to the real data and, and use those in place of our guesses. So um, fluorescent lights in existing buildings are somewhat similar. Um, and so it's something that can be measured in one building and that real data can be applied to other buildings later to be, to be more accurate. And then similarly, uh, a model uh, of the life cycle cost analysis using uh, Monte Carlo simulation can be used to drive negotiations and eliminate uncertain variables. And what I mean by that would be something like the um, energy price escalation um, by acknowledging that there is variability we, we create a bigger spread, a bigger distribution of, of results uh, in the life cycle cost analysis. And if an owner um, or a decision maker is willing to say, you know, let's just use a static value for that, in that case, the spread of results uh, uh, narrows. And so there's ways to uh, maybe influence how the decision is made by deciding which variables should have uncertainty and how much, and that's, that's part of negotiating. So with that said, um, to recap what we did this morning, uh, we went through a little bit of an introduction to what life cycle cost analysis is, and we showed a, a typical life cycle cost analysis in Excel using static single point estimates. We talked about how Monte Carlo simulation is performed, and we showed how we can embed uh, Monte Carlo type tools into an Excel spreadsheet to do life cycle cost analysis, and we uh, compared some results and discussed some conclusions, and uh, at, at this point, um, my presentation to you is over, and uh, if you have questions, I would be happy to try to provide you some answers. That was great, Tony. Thank you so much. That was very clear. We really appreciate that. And this, uh, this is going to be a great addition to our recording archive also. I, I do have a couple questions. Uh, the escalation changes by the same amount each year or a different amount according to the distribution function? That is a great question. And the answer is that it will change um, energy, it, it changes with energy prices uh, experienced by the utility. So in, in real life, you know, I've, I've come up with a, a very simple model here. And the way this model is working is it is using um, a single uh, number for escalation through all of the years. That is not physically correct in real life, it's for the sake of illustration. Um, what, what you could do to, to improve the accuracy would be to make a column in, in each of these alternatives. And instead of having one distribution, you would copy that distribution um, into multiple cells so that each year can be a different escalation uh, unrelated to the escalation the year before. That would be more accurate. And, and you could sort of expand your model with complexity to the point of some utilities uh, experience real-time pricing in, in different, uh, let's call them energy sources. So some are purchasing electricity on the spot markets and are purchasing natural gas. And in both of those prices, 
may be changing uh, by the hour or, or more. And you could incorporate that level of variability into your model, um, but you would end up with a spreadsheet that's uh, quite big for a web yeah. analysis. Great, thank you. Let's see if we have any more questions. Hmm. We'll just wait a minute. There are uh, a few attendees wonder, would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, I just wanted to add to the folks out there, this will be recorded and archived on our website. We had a couple questions about that. Let's see. We'll wait another little bit, see if we have a, another question that came in. Ah, we've got sure. a couple a couple more just came in. The mean value of the output distribution will not change if the mean of all input distributions are the same as the fixed values. I wondered Agreed. if Okay, good. <laughs> Do you use real option analysis? Perhaps changing investments down the road or expanding the changes? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I don't. And so this is, uh, let's say, the, the first level of expansion on existing uh, life cycle cost analysis calculators. And, and there's definitely a bit more in regard to um, options pricing, energy pricing, and, and some of the let's call it the more financial side of the analysis that, that could be incorporated, but I think this is sort of the first basic expansion on, on a typical life cycle cost calculator. Hmm. Ah, here's one, here's one more. Does this model here use correlation between escalation and, say, maintenance costs? If escalation goes up, then so do maintenance costs? It, it doesn't, but that would be, um, again, uh, similar to, uh, I think it was the first question, um, a, a good way to more accurately model reality, um, although you add that one degree of complexity to, to your model. And, and I think the, the point that the um, person with the question is making, which I agree with, is that the inflation component, the, the inflation in, you know, I'm, I'm saying the United States, but whatever the country it is, uh, is related to both, uh, let's call it O&M cost escalation as it relates to wages, as well as uh, material pricing. And that inflation component is also embedded in the energy price escalation. So there is, mm -hmm. there is a correlation there, it's just not modeled in this particular <laughs> stretch. Makes sense. Well, I think we have time for one more question if one comes in. Let's see. Well, if I, if I don't get to every question now, is it okay if our attendees email you? Or you can, of course, email me and I can forward it to? Sure, that would be fine. And uh, let's see. We do have a couple. Well, great, because I'll uh, if I if I miss them right now, I'll have a report of them, so I'll be able to forward those too. Tony, we want to thank you very much for this. Sure, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, this was great, and, and thank you, everybody. Yes, thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye. All right, goodbye, everyone.